Beast Fables. One of the earliest forms of literature, these moral tales have been passed down for thousands of years all over the world. Featuring anthropomorphic animals, these stories have had a variety of uses, from pedagogical tools to biting social commentary. But why use animals? Why not just teach parables, stories that lack anthropomorphic or personified characters? I think Lisa Hannawalt, creator of Tuca and Birdie and production designer for BoJack Horseman, said it best. I think using animals helps to make the stories feel more universal, because if I was using you know, real human faces and actors, you would kind of associate those human faces with people you know from your own life because we're so attuned to looking at humans. We'd be like, oh, that looks like my second grade teacher or like my best friend or my husband. Um, but when we're using animals, like you can really kind of project yourself onto them and sort of feel the same things that they're feeling. And it makes it a little more cathartic and a little more allegorical. The universal and allegorical power of using animals in storytelling has remained constant for millennia with some changes over time. So how do we get from this to this? Well, let's start at the beginning. Part one, early beast fables. Well, that's easier said than done. Oral tales about anthropomorphic animals, such as coyotes in many Native American tribes folklore, to foxes in East Asian folklore, have existed for thousands of years. So for simplicity, I'm gonna be mainly focusing on early written works. Let's just go chronologically through some of the heavy hitters, starting with your boy Aesop, and yes, that is technically the correct English pronunciation. I will now start calling him Aesop because that just sounds wrong. <laughs> Aesop was a Thracian slave who lived in Samos from about 620 to 564 BCE. Maybe. Like Homer, his existence as a real individual has been called into question by some historians. To Westerners, Aesop's fables are probably the most familiar of the old text I'm going to be talking about in this section. Stories such as the town mouse and the country mouse, the tortoise and the hare, the Farmer and the Viper, and many others have been adapted countless times. However, sometimes those proverbs are a little odd to modern audiences. Sometimes Aesop wrote the moral you're supposed to take at the end. He did it with this one, and the moral forbatim is, look and see which way the wind blows before you commit yourself. So are you saying to follow the crowd? Like, go with the flow? That's not really good moral, Aesop. Aesop didn't pull over 400 stories out of his ass, though. Many were based on existing proverbs and oral traditions from Europe, Africa, and Asia. Speaking of Asia, let's move on over to India and talk about the Panchatantra. The Panchatantra is a Sanskrit collection of fables created around 200 BCE in India. Like the Aesopica, the Panchatantra draws on previous oral tradition and is considered a Hindu classic. It is the most translated piece of Indian literature. Despite this, I admit I'm not too familiar with most of the tales in the Panchatantra, other than how the rabbit fooled the elephant and the girl who married a snake. But since it was such an influential text in South and West Asia, I had to mention it. And finally, moving back west to medieval Western Europe and Germany, we have literature's favorite trickster, Renard the Fox. Ugh, not that one. Well, Okay, that one, but from the 12th century, that's better. Renard is kind of like a Greek god in that he is a complete ass to everyone around him, hashtag justice for Grimbard, but still manages to get away with it. Like Robin Hood, Renard is a lovable rogue who spends his time outwitting the authorities while also lampooning the feudal system in the church. Fun fact, the reason that Disney's Robin Hood depicts the cast as animals is because Disney initially was planning on making an adaptation of Renard the Fox, but Renard was too much of a scumbag to be a Disney hero, so they ended up scrapping the idea for decades until they came up with the idea for Robin Hood. But we'll come back to animation later. Part 2, Beast Fables in more recent literature. We are in a really big hurry. I am on it break. Ah! It's not about how badly you want something. It's about what you are capable of. I am. I'm gonna let go! What? We may be evolved, but we all make mistakes. No matter what type of animal you are, change starts with you. The stories use phonetically spelled African-American vernacular to convey the stories of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear, 
some of which actually resemble African folk tales, including, ironically, the infamous Tar Baby story, which is quite similar to an Akan folk tale about the spider Anansi. Most of the stories were about how Br'er Rabbit was able to outwit and escape Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear using his smarts. Put a pin in Uncle Remus. We'll be returning to him during the animation segment. As time went on, stories with anthropomorphic characters began to be more geared towards children. One early 20th century author known for children's stories featuring anthropomorphic animals was Beatrix Potter, most famous for the tale of Peter Rabbit. Potter's stories have clearly had a large impact on children for the last hundred years, as there have been numerous adaptations of her work, both live action and animated, with varying degrees of quality. There were a ton of works over the 20th century featuring anthropomorphic animals geared at children, such as Little Bear and Franklin the Turtle, but I wanted to mention a personal favorite author of mine, Arnold Lowell. Lowell is most famous for the Frog and Toad books, which feature a pair of amphibious gay icons, but my personal favorite book, and the book that's most relevant to this discussion, was appropriately titled Fables. The first fable, The Crocodile in the Bedroom, a fable about a crocodile who seemingly has OCD, has stuck with me for years. The stories and fables exist in a more modern setting, well, modern for 1981, and have a more playful than didactic tone. Part 3. Beast Fables in Animation and Species as Shorthand Books featuring anthro characters continue to be relevant to a wide variety of audiences, but in the early 20th century, a new medium was on the rise. Animation. Early animation was painstakingly produced, so animators had to come up with very simplistic designs. However, there are a few distinguishing characteristics that humans possess, and there aren't very many unique silhouettes you can come up with. Enter funny animals, a solution to the limited options human characters granted animators, and a solution to blackface falling out of favor. All of that didn't stop Warner Brothers. Felix the Cat, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Foxy the Fox, and the mouse himself, Mickey, all came from this era, the silent age of animation. During the preceding golden age of animation, Warner Brothers prospered with the creation of Looney Tunes, which featured a predominant cast of animals, and other studios created other iconic characters such as Woody Woodpecker, Droopy, Heckle and Jekyll, and others. Like the Beast Fables of old, these cartoons initially were intended for adult audiences, but over time were gradually more geared towards kids. With a few exceptions. Speaking of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it and other animations feature a shift in character design that hadn't really been present during the silent era. Species is shorthand. In animation and visual media in general, character designers often use shorthand and exaggeration to communicate characters' personalities to viewers. With animal characters, one particularly easy way to do this is to choose the species wisely. Herbivores are often guileless sweeties like bunnies. Carnivores, especially canines like dogs and wolves, are typically heroic. And reptiles and some mammals like rats are often shady and villainous. Take a look at these weasels from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Even if you take away their gangster outfits, they still look shady as hell. Although not much like actual weasels, interestingly enough. In addition to indicating the personalities of the characters, Species choice can also serve as symbolism. For instance, the Furious Five and Kung Fu Panda all represent different styles of Chinese martial arts. Speaking of symbolism, let's talk about racism. Uh, I mean, racial coding. As I alluded to earlier, inkblot cartoons during the silent age were a continuation of minstrel shows in a time where blackface was starting to fall out of favor. Even as cartoons developed past that, the underlying racism didn't just go away. Animals were still sometimes used as racial caricatures in later animation such as the crows in Dumbo or the Siamese cats in Lady and the Tramp. In Song of the South, Disney's infamous adaptation of the Uncle Remus stories, almost all of the animated characters are voiced by black actors and use heavy black vernacular like in Chandler's original stories. Years later, Coonskin, written and directed by Ralph Bakshi, took Uncle Remus in a bit more of an adult direction, which involves sex and crime and explicit satire of racist black caricatures. In his more well-known work, Fritz the Cat, Bakshi also uses species symbolism by depicting the police officers as pigs. This stuff can be really subtle, I know. Part 4. Modern Allegories Using Animals One of the most powerful uses of animals in storytelling is its allegorical potential. George Orwell's Animal Farm, Baby's First Allegory, plays the allegory card pretty straight. The humans are Russia's pre-revolution government and capitalists, pigs are the communist oligarchs, the horses are the working class, the sheep are... sheep etc. It's pretty straightforward. Another famous piece of visual media using animal allegory is Mouse, the graphic novel by Art Spiegelman about his Polish-Jewish grandfather during the Holocaust. The graphic novel depicts the Jews as mice, 
the Germans as cats, and the Poles as pigs. Interestingly, this is not the only, or even the first work, to depict the Jewish people as mice. An American tale features the Russian Jews fleeing the Cossacks as mice and cats, respectively. While the French comic from World War II, Mickey Alcamp de Gers, features Mickey Mouse in an unauthorized appearance, as a Jew in the Gers internment camp. The last modern allegory I want to talk about is North Korea's Squirrel and Hedgehog. Having aired from 1977 to 2013, it's about the anthropomorphic residents of Flower Hill, an analog to North Korea, being attacked by the nefarious weasels, mice, and, starting in 2006, wolves. While it's never stated outright, it's fairly obvious that various animals represent North Korea and its armed forces, the weasels represent the Japanese, the mice represent the South Koreans, and the wolves represent the Americans. There are also one-off characters like Uncle Bear, representing the falling USSR, and Lieutenant Vixen, an aide to the Americans. This cartoon is infamous for its graphic violence despite its child audience, as well as for being a blatant piece of propaganda. Part 5. Subversions of the Beast Fable While using species as shorthand is one method of using animals in character design, Another way designers and writers are using these characters is subverting that shorthand. Creators know that many audience members view certain animals in a certain way, and they utilize these assumptions to create plot twists, while also causing audience members to question the previous assumptions that they had made. In an American tale, Tiger is a cat and member of the gang who terrorizes the mice in New York City, but it turns out that he's actually a sweetheart, and he later ends up helping the mice. In Kung Fu Panda, everyone, including the audience, underestimates Poe because he's a panda, but he ends up using his attributes to his advantage against Tai Long and later antagonists. In Beastars, the protagonist Lugosi, a wolf, struggles to keep his carnivorous nature in check, but that doesn't stop him from loving Haru, a dwarf rabbit, with all of his heart. Speaking of canon lagomorph relationships, let's talk about Zootopia. You guys had to know that this one was coming. The lifeblood of Zootopia is the acknowledgement and subversion of stereotypes. Allegorically, much of the prejudice in the film relates to issues of race, class, and gender in the real world, although there's not a one-to-one -one correlation, as some people might assume. In Zootopia, there doesn't appear to be a history of oppression by one certain group, and the prejudice experienced by certain characters such as Judy, Clawhauser, Nick, and Bellwether is more omnidirectional. What race or class in Zootopia has the most power is not as simple as predator versus prey, although the media within the story does try to push that black and white narrative. Zootopia uses animals with clear stereotypes attached to them, dumb bunny, sly fox, and turns those stereotypes upside down. You have a cheetah who's fat, a bunny who can take down cops, a shrew who's a mob boss, and a sheep who ends up being the mastermind trying to incite riots. Get the film also plays some stereotypes straight. Weaselton is a weasel who's a crook. Lionheart is a lion who's in a position of power, etc. And then there's Nick, poor sweet Nicholas. A fox who is conniving and duplicitous, but only because he thought he had to be that way due to society's expectations of him. This movie just does so much, you guys. <laughs> Conclusion. The Leeuwenmensch, German for Lion Man, is from about 3,500 to 40,000 years ago and is the oldest piece of figurative art discovered by archaeologists. People have literally been interested in anthropomorphic animals since the Stone Age. And if trends in visual media are anything to go by, I think that the Beast Fable is here to stay.